A couple of weeks ago, I watched what is probably one of the weirdest and most beautiful things ever uploaded to YouTube. Let me just show you a little bit because you really have to see it to believe it. See what I mean? Not quite. Okay, here's a little more. I took the stairs. This is Interface a series created by Justin Tomchuk and published to his channel, Umami, between 2017 and 2021. If you haven't already watched it, you should. It's not very long, and I guarantee it's unlike almost anything else you've seen before. Maybe even do it before you finish this video, because there will be some spoilers, if that's even really possible for this thing. Interface is weird. It simultaneously feels like a kaleidoscopic fever dream, and at the same time, something extremely familiar. It features a world which has, over just a few generations, undergone an indescribable and irreversible change. A world in the process of unraveling and weaving itself back together into a shape no one can quite predict. A world where the old way of life has died and still haunts the future with its ghosts. Do you ever feel like the main story just isn't enough when you read a book or watch a movie? Are you left hankering for a fuller experience? More about the characters, the setting, the world it all takes place in? Well, good news. There's a new way to read that will give you exactly that. Campfire is a platform that allows authors to share as much of their world as they want and makes it all easy for you to find while you're reading. Visit thetailfoundry.com slash campfire to get started for free. A big thanks to Campfire for sponsoring this video. The year was 1943. Our ship was stationed in Philadelphia and was equipped to generate an electromagnetic field that would make us invisible to the enemy. What happened instead, we were teleported to New York. I was destroyed. Forced to regain my physicality. This is how Mischief, one of the main characters of Interface, describes the event that changed the world forever. A moment known simply as the paradigm shift. It's unclear how or why this shift occurred, but the fallout of this event has forever altered the course of history and the way humans live their lives. One of the most obvious changes was the sudden discovery of what they've come to call cerebral electricity. It's a hard thing to describe as if the concept of inspiration or creativity itself has become a physical substance, this sort of staticky material that leaks out of dead organisms. And if this is basically the manifest material of an individual's mind, all the things that informed who or what that thing was and made it unique, now discorporate, removed from their dead body. In a way, you could almost call that their ghost. Cerebral electricity, according to the scientists tasked with studying it, has always existed, but the events of 1943 snapped it into visibility. What once was unknown to mankind became tangible. And despite the fact that it had existed harmlessly this whole time, its sudden detection was seen by some as a threat. Not the only one, of course. The paradigm shift also brought with it new life. Monsters to some, friends to others. 
a big green floating hand thing, a giant purple octopus, mischief. Strange and surreal beings, like dreams that have escaped the mind and gone to live among the populace. And when I say live, I do mean it. From what we see in the series, it looks as if these beings integrate pretty well into human society. I mean, the octopus has a job as a sushi chef, the giant green hand raises a child as a single parent for a couple of years. For all we know, most people have just accepted that this is the way that things are now. Even so, I think it would be hard not to worry about at least a few of these changes. The sky itself is turned red. How do you take that as anything other than a sign of the apocalypse? There are certainly more than a few people out there who do see this paradigm shift as a bad thing, as a marker of the world spinning out of their control. Enter Greetings Robotics a government-mandated technology company with the goal of restoring life to the way it was before. The company has figured out a way to harness that cerebral electricity, those ghosts that I've mentioned before. They've repurposed them into something that humans can use to protect themselves from these changes. The paradigm shift is literally presented as terrorism. The CEO of Greetings Robotics literally speaks about his company's mission at an anti-terrorism summit. This mindset seems to get a lot of support, especially from other world leaders, who, I think it's safe to say from our real-world experience, tend to be a bit self-serving, out of touch. So, what is this solution that Greetings Robotics has proposed? How are they going to turn this cerebral electricity into something to save this dying world? Two words. The Interface. I think anyone with basic computer literacy knows what an interface is, but that might just be my robotic biases speaking. Simply put, interfaces are the systems by which the human user of a machine interacts with and controls it. In much the same way, the so-called interface that Greetings Robotics develops is a way that humans more acclimated to the past can interact with it again by living inside of it. The interface is an artificial, carefully controlled version of the world that emulates the way things were before this paradigm shift. Even though it's completely artificial, just pre-existing memories whisked together and regurgitated to appear brand new, it's still easier for some people to stomach than watching the world they've known become so very strange. What is it about this new world that has Greetings Robotics scrambling to reverse this paradigm shift in the first place? What is it that these people are so threatened by? Remember earlier when I said that there were all kinds of new creatures hanging around, holding down jobs and picking up their kids from school? One of the characters I mentioned then, Mischief, is almost like a mascot for this new world. He was one of the first things to come from the paradigm shift. Before that, Mischief used to be human. In fact, he was one of the humans who was on the ship that was teleported back in 1943 when the paradigm shift occurred. In that moment, Mischief was destroyed, but not killed. He transcended into the pink shape-shifting clown you see before you, shedding his human form and old life for something far greater. Though Mischief lost his humanity, he also seems to have benefited from this shift, gaining a variety of strange powers, as well as what I can only describe as a broader cosmic perspective. Throughout the story, we see him consuming cerebral electricity as he comes across it, like some sort of creativity scavenger. This new world is a boundless source of inspiration and beauty to him. He frequently stops just to muse about it. So, what do you do if you're an extra-dimensional clown worm with nothing to do besides turn into different things and eat static ghosts? Why, you find a blue guy and follow him around for a while, of course. Enter Henrik. For a lot of the series, it's not quite clear what the two are doing together. It sort of seems like mischief is just taking him on a sightseeing tour, a dark ride through the weird new world of the post-paradigm shift Toronto. 
It seems that way because, as far as I can tell, that's exactly what he's doing. I think what Mischief really wants is to expose Henrik, this sort of innocuous everyman, to the realities of this shift. He's acting as a guide through this new normal, Henrik's own personal Virgil, just with pink skin and an uncanny smile. It's meaningful to know that a creature like Mischief likes to eat noodles, just like everyone else. But the inherent, sort of terrifying weirdness of Mischief cannot be denied. Yeah, he eats noodles, but like I said earlier, he also eats ghosts. Not just that, he really seems to enjoy it, too. There's this one part where he comes across the body of a dead frog, and he's sort of giddy about slurping up the static leaking out of it. He doesn't know very much about frogs. Eating this frog ghost allows him to understand things he never could have as a human, in this case, what it's like to be a frog. In the following episode, he spends a while just hanging out in frog form, figuring out how to rib it, all that, and then ditching that shape as soon as the novelty wears off. That's a kind of cute example. Mischief can be pretty cute. But it gets a lot darker, too. There's another part where we find him waiting at the site of a future car accident, just so he can feed on the ghosts. It's supper time, he says, just before the accident. This isn't just a toppled tree or a heron killing a frog anymore. Mischief is directly benefiting from human suffering. And you have to wonder, does he even care about the deaths he relies on for sustenance? Or is it just dinner and a show for him? In a weird way, I do actually get where Mischief is coming from here. The paradigms of our world, here in the reality that you and I occupy, are also changing at an alarming rate. What it means to be creative is evolving faster than any of us could have ever predicted. As the old paradigms die, there's so much displaced inspiration left floating around in the ether. Why not claim it as soon as it becomes available to you? Devour those ghosts and let them fuel you. Turn the ghosts of a bygone time into forward motion? New life? Well, we find out a little later in the story that those ghosts he ate at the site of the accident, they belonged to some of Henrik's family. Precious memories and experiences digested as supper in his gut. When Mischief realizes this, he muses to Henrik, What have I consumed? What consumes you? A very real recognition that perhaps... Not all ghosts are for devouring. That some elements of the past, once lost in the fevered pursuit of a dreamlike future, can never be recovered. That's what the interface is for. Like I mentioned earlier, not everyone is enjoying this strange future as much as mischief. Not everyone wants to see their past reduced to pure nutrients for the future. And the CEO of Greetings Robotics, Joseph Greetings, aims to keep that from happening. Like Mischief, he was on the ship that teleported back in 1943. But unlike Mischief, instead of transcending, he was traumatized. While Mischief was off essentially becoming a god, Joseph had to bear witness to his shipmates bodies fusing with the hull of the ship. He heard their muffled screams from beneath the metal, saw the severed pieces of their bodies drifting away on plumes of static gore. He literally witnessed their ghosts departing from their bodies. When Joseph sees Mischief's new form, it isn't as a transcendent, godlike being, but as another unmistakably monstrous result of the paradigm shift. Knowing all this, can we really blame him for treating this new world as something to fear? Maybe the framing of these new creatures and substances as agents of terrorism isn't completely baseless. Maybe there is a need to defend the world from them. That's why, before he finished the interface, he created a weapon against this new post-paradigm world. Kami. 
Kami serves as the villain for much of the series. She's a robot fueled by cerebral electricity, designed with the sole purpose of hunting down and destroying things that resulted from the paradigm shift. But, of course, she doesn't just destroy them. Like mischief, she consumes them. She is how Greetings Robotics first answers the problem of restoring life as it was before. And she is devastatingly effective in that role, even when it sometimes looks like separating a child from the giant green hand thing that raised her, or utterly obliterating the local sushi chef. Kami and the Interface, the two major developments from Greetings Robotics, were created with the express purpose of destroying the new and preserving the old. Joseph Greetings, who saw fit to create these things, is sort of a figurehead for everyone who longs to go back to the nostalgia and security of the past. He and those like him are convinced that if they don't do something to stop this change from snowballing, they'll become obsolete, lost in the turning of the world, ground to dust and forgotten, the death of the old world. This fear, as reactionary as it may seem, is also sort of justified. Even in the real world, change is scary. It necessitates danger. As the world turns and paradigms shift, things are bound to be lost. Precious things. I think the desire to preserve them is only natural, but ultimately, you just can't hold on to the past forever, can you? If nothing ever changed, nothing would ever change. Progress would cease. Reality would be a purgatory. Your children and their children and their children's children would repeat the same pattern over and over until the cosmos collapsed into a mundane pattern preserved for its own sake. Kami and Mischief may both consume ghosts, but unlike Mischief, Kami isn't just doing it for nourishment. Kami is holding them hostage, collecting them for the construction of the interface. She and her master are building an idyllic replica of the world that once was, but it's also a world made of ghosts. Not really a life at all, but an afterlife, unchanging, doomed to an eternity of sameness. Maybe that's what some people want. To me, it sounds like hell. Through all of this, Henrik has been quiet. He's not just some hapless tourist on mischief's sightseeing journey. He's not just some blue guy. In fact, he's barely a guy at all at this point. Like mischief, Henrik was also affected by the paradigm shift. He's been alive for more than a hundred years at this point. He's seen the worst of mankind in his work as a photographer, shooting images of warfare. And he's seen the best, too, in his family. But that's all gone now. His family died in that car crash, remember? The one mischief was waiting for? Supper time. So now, immortal, a product of the new world still yearning for the ghosts of his past, what is he to do? At the end of the series, the choices are laid out for him. Live within the interface and be reunited with his dead loved ones, even though they're artificial. Or accept that they're gone and face his uncertain future without them. Is that sounding a little relatable? I think it should be. As our world changes, we find ourselves trapped in a similar dilemma. You and me, and everyone else who is caught between these two poles, yanked back and forth in the gray area between accepting and rejecting change. The world we knew is dying, and we're facing its ghosts for the first time. If you were mischief, you would love this. You would be eager to forget the past, devour the things that brought you here, and make new life out of them. Experience is everything. The paradigm must be made to shift. If you were Joseph Greetings, you would be terrified. You would cling to the past, devour everything you can before it can be lost, and hold it in the belly of your memory forever. The paradigm is everything. It must not be allowed to shift. 
in the end, Henrik ends up in a world without either of them. A world with a red sky and strange creatures, and this man who is not a man, carrying his past within him, choosing to live in the uncertain but undeniably beautiful present. The ghosts were always there, and always will be. The trick, it turns out, is living alongside them. Phew, gotta be honest here. This was kind of a hard one to talk about. It's not really much of a story, per se. It's more of an experience, which is actually pretty refreshing. I've always thought of a story as more than just a series of events. It's not just things happening, right? Sometimes I just want to hear about the author's weird idea for alien plant life, or I want to get the backstory on that bizarre side character from chapter 3, or maybe I just want to visualize what the world of the story looks like. Unfortunately, there's never really been a good medium for that kind of experience. Books and movies tend to be very plot-oriented, and games are very limited by the resources available to the development team. But wouldn't it be awesome if there were just some easy way to do all of this? To get as much of a world as an author is willing to share with you? No restrictions? You can probably already tell where I'm going with this. Someone has, in fact, already made this. It's a little app called Campfire, and it just so happens to be this video's sponsor. When you first look at this thing, it kind of just seems like a reading app. And you can read on it, of course. In fact, the reading experience is outstanding. You can save your favorite titles to bookshelves, make custom selections, organize your to-be-read, everything you'd expect from a reading app. But the thing that really makes Campfire incredible is that it's so interactive. Every book is also, basically, its own entire fan wiki. Except, this time, everything is canon. Every title comes with its own character profiles, interactive maps, exclusive short stories, whatever the author decides to include. That's right, you heard me. The authors are part of this too. They're right here on the app, creating these experiences firsthand. It's really a whole different approach to the publishing industry altogether. No more layers of bureaucratic separation between the creator and their audience. You're both right here, making and enjoying these worlds together. You could even reach out and say hi. Heck, you could become one of them if you wanted to. And you really might just want to. Authors on Campfire earn higher royalties than on any other platform. So, when you buy a book there, you know you are mainly supporting the artist, not just some massive, faceless corporation. To create a free account and start exploring, just visit the link on screen right now, or click the link in the description. I hope you'll give it a try. Anyway, that's all for this one. Thanks for watching, and keep making stuff up. I'll see you next week. Bye!